Hi everyone, this is Cam Garrity. Welcome back to This Should Have Been a Phone Call. Today on the show, we have one of my closest collaborators in the world of puppetry, Mr. Adam Krutinger. Adam is an amazing puppeteer and puppet builder, but he is also an, a father and a remarkable art teacher as well. He has a YouTube channel where he teaches hundreds of thousands of people how to make puppets and how to bring them to life. We have known each other now for 11 years, which is so crazy. Um, I've had the benefit of learning so much because of Adam's wisdom and patience. And uh, it really meant a lot that he came on uh, one of these first episodes to have this chat with me. I think you're really going to like it a lot. And quickly addressing the elephant in the room, we do host our own podcast together on his channel, uh, The Puppeteers Podcast. We've been doing that for about four years. So if you enjoy this conversation that we have together, I definitely encourage you to go check out us talking to other kinds of puppeteers. It's a whole different kind of show. But if you don't like this conversation, uh, then go check us out over at Puppeteers because that's a completely different show. This should have been a phone call with my Geppetto, Adam Krutinger. I, I gotta tell you, you're probably the person of all the folks I have on my guest list at this point. I'm probably most nervous for having you on. <laughs> I can only imagine why. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure you know. I'm sure you know. No, I I have tremendous respect for what you uh, think about me and the work work that I do. Um, and so I I I, I want to make you happy, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, by the time uh, this comes out, uh, you're going to be a father of two. Yeah, yeah, I will. Are be. you are you ready? Like, has your brain shifted? I'm ready as I'll ever be. You know, <laughs> I, I, I as you as you probably have noticed, knowing me, I don't uh, I don't really get ready for anything. I just let <laughs> let let the ball keep rolling and roll with the punches. That's fair. That's fair. What was the change? Because you know, I obviously don't have kids, and I hear from anybody and everybody that it's it recontextualizes everything and it's this whole new world and did you feel that with fred not really i think i, I think it does it for a lot of people um but uh, as you know i'm from a very big family i've been changing diapers since i was uh, like six uh so a lot of it just came normal to me you know my youngest brother was born when i was in you know upper high school uh, so, so you're just jaded to the whole baby thing at this well, point. Well, no, no, it's not that. Well, <laughs> no, another no, thing no. too. I've, uh, I think people do parenting in an interesting way. I have so many friends who they just change their whole lives around uh, a newborn, and really, I don't think that that's how it should go. I think you should uh, kind of fit the the newborns uh, in, into your life. I think yeah. that's, I think that's the the way to do it because in the same way. Um, you don't want to, you know, as a kid's growing up, you don't want to, you know, force them into anything that they wouldn't otherwise want to do. Um, I wouldn't have wanted to be a burden on my parents and keep them from doing things that they wanted to do while I was growing up. And, uh, and I don't think that I did. And, uh, I'm going to let Fred be her own person completely. And, um, you know, and I, I can still continue on with my dream so many people like stop pursuing things that they want to do when they have kids because again like you're saying their priorities change and my priorities haven't changed i just have more priorities now right more <laughs> more um more things more to take care of, which is fine more, yeah more balls in the air exactly and i think that's the best way to look at it without a doubt that's uh that's that's fair uh have, have you ever gotten enough sleep uh, once in a while, once in a while I do, but the thing is I, it's not a matter of like opportunity there. I just have trouble sleeping my whole life. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's either, you know, laying in my bed, stare at the ceiling 
or keep working on stuff until I uh, heal over. So, right, right, restless body for an already restless mind. Yes, exactly. Um, so when this comes out, um, it will also be uh, at a momentous point in our history um, because we would have been we're, we've we've been ruining each other's lives for the last. 11 years adam krutinger oh wow 11 is that it yeah wow feels longer actually yeah it's um it's a weird thing how that time just kind of flips by um both it's it seems to squash and stretch because yeah it um it spot coffee feels like forever ago um when we would hang out there and just you know, meet and be the weirdos in the corner with a bunch of puppets. Um, but it also, I don't know, it it's strange how that kind of stuff happens. Yeah, yeah, even just thinking about the Puppeteers podcast. So, like, what we're going on our fourth year, right? Yeah, we're in our fourth year now. So, you know, thinking that that's, you know, more than a third. It's crazy to think of that as a third of our... I um, know working together like that. That doesn't seem right. That seems no. That, that feels like and we that just feels like that. yesterday we started. Yeah. 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 Wow. I don't know if we're if we're able to talk about this. How's um, how's how's the the Muppets for the Studebaker coming? I I, I suppose I should say for for reference for people who don't know, Adam is currently working on. Um, well, well, you tell them. I... I'm, I'm making some replicas of Fozzie and Kermit for the Studebaker Museum in South Bend, Indiana. They're doing a big fundraising campaign to have the old Studebaker from the Muppet movie um, refurbished. And they want to have, right now they have these disgusting <laughs> stuffed animals in there that look terrible. Just awful. So I'm going to build some puppets. And and like we were talking, I was going to make them one-to-one scale, but, but we both know that they, they they cheat the camera so much in there, and if Kermit was like sitting down in there, he wouldn't even be able to see out the window. So I'm going to change the scale enough to make it look right, but not make it look. Um, I, I don't know it's just it's just hard to explain. I feel like if they were actual size, people would look at it and think it looked wrong. Yeah, because that's something we've we've both been surprised by in the past of just how how tiny the the puppets are in real life. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. So are you, like for me, if I had gotten a, a call from the Studebaker Museum um, and said, hey, you know, can we interest you in building us some some Kermits and Fozzie, or a Kermit and a Fozzie, I think I would have lost my mind. Like, are you ex- are you excited for the prospect of having your work live on in that way? Or like, is it just another gig for you? I, I didn't think of it really as that at all. I just, uh, and actually I, I emailed them or rather I messaged them on Instagram as a recommendation of my friend. I think it was Kevin Williams who uh, recommended. He said that they just have these, these terrible stuffed animals in there and that they, they might jump on the opportunity. And I just thought it would be fun. You know, it's a, it's a, this is a donation to, to a cause to get this um, refurbished. They're not paying me because they're, copyrighted characters I, I i wouldn't accept payment anyway for something like that um so i'm just doing it as yeah for the for the fundraiser for them and they were very excited about it especially that i'm going to make a, a youtube video on it to help promote their uh their campaign for it and yeah i just i didn't even really think about it in that in any way because again they're not my they're not my, obviously they're not my characters and um i just thought it would be just be fun really a fun challenge i'm always looking for a good challenge <laughs> Yeah, and I suppose not only aren't they your characters, but they're also not the version of Kermit and Fozzie from your favorite Muppets movie, either. Yeah, like probably yeah. if it, if you could have your way, it'd be the the National, you know, Pirate Museum or something, and you'd be <laughs> giving them a Mister Bimbo and a uh, Captain Smollett. I I guess so. Yeah, I just thought it would be kind of cool, fun collaboration. So, Adam, weird question. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's a physical possession that you've had for the longest? Oh, my gosh. Anything that I have for a long time isn't on purpose. 
<laughs> it's just something I haven't cleaned out yet. I mean, I'm just looking around myself. Probably, probably this industrial sewing machine behind me. I've had that for for quite a while. Um, it's traveled around with me a little bit. I don't know, man. I don't think I have anything like from my childhood, really. Unless there's something that I'm just completely blanking out on, I don't think so. You know, not much is that precious to me in that way. I'm always kind of making new things. Again, that's part of why I gravitated so much to puppetry, because it's, it's an art form that has two lives from a maker standpoint, is uh, the creation of the art piece and then the performance of it, which is what I like so much about it, which is also why I clung so much to doing theater and whatnot. It just seemed like the best of both worlds. And I, I know we've talked about, too, like just how much joy you get out of seeing... Not only like, you know, if if you perform a puppet and you put it in a video or if I do something, but like when you've sold your eBay puppets or you do something for Theater of Youth, being able to see it like really have some degrees of separation away from you and see it have a, a, a life beyond beyond what you created. Oh, yeah, that's definitely always the best. And, and actually probably the thing that I like most about um what we were talking about before working with that museum um even though it's not my characters just the idea that people are going to be able to it's going to enhance something that they're already doing in some way it's just kind of exciting to me it'll make that because it's one thing to just oh there's the car from from the movie it's like yeah cool enough but like oh my gosh there's there's the characters inside it just makes it that much more special and um but yeah yeah it again like like you said same with my ebay puppets Obviously, Arlo the monster is the one I'm most proud of. He's surpassed me by by many times. Um, so uh, yeah, his his YouTube channel has over half a million subscribers on it. Yeah, this is a guy who uh, has taken a character that he he just wanted on eBay, right? Yeah, and, and it was one of the cheapest ones that ever ever sold on that, uh, just by happenstance. Yeah, and now it he he plays video games on Twitch and and things like that, and yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, the guy built a nice little empire for himself there with that puppet. What do you wish that you weren't scared of as a kid? These are weird questions. I don't think about myself often in this kind of a way. Um, That's what they're here I, for. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Um, I guess I would just say like. You know, I, I th- you know, this is almost a cliche at this point because a lot of people are shy as a kid. But, you know, I was very shy as a kid. Um, and I guess I could say I wish I was less shy, but that might change what I turned into because, like, now I don't really care what anybody thinks about anything. So I just, I don't know, I don't know exactly how that happened or, or where it happened. But, um, yeah, I guess, I guess when I was a kid, a lot of times I was always, like, Wishing I had said something when I didn't, you know, wishing I had raised my hand when, when I didn't and, or, uh, and, and things, things like that. What would you say was the thing that was able to sort of break you out from that shell? I guess, I guess what I was always waiting for was permission in some way, right? Permission to kind of do something that I wanted, like waiting for the direction and at some point that just went away. Like I stopped asking for permission and just did things that I wanted to do. You know, I feel like a lot of people need, they feel like they need permission from somebody. Well, think about like we talk about a lot, like working on productions and stuff. So we know so many other friends that are puppeteers that sit down and, and wait for the phone to ring for a project. And, and me and you, we just, we often create a lot of our own projects. We don't wait for permission to wait for that opportunity to come by. I, I don't, I, I don't know. It was, it was something, something in high school, I think it, it's, about, it's around when I found magic doing magic shows, because again, like I said, I was very shy. I grew up with a, a terrible speech impediment my entire life. I had speech therapy from kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade. And in eighth grade, they said, um, We've done all we could for you. (laughs) Yes, they said, we've done all we can for you. You are just going to have the speech impediment forever. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> great. Do you guys pay me now or <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I again, like anybody, nervous for public speaking. I still am in a lot of ways. And um and again, like the the magic helped helped a lot. I was just doing it by myself, you know, doing card tricks here and there for my family and whatnot. And uh, one thing that helped a lot with I think magic that really helped me a lot in my puppetry was um you know, in doing theater you're involved in a production and there's a lot of people on it and in a magic show it's most of the time just yourself. So I was able to not have to rely on anybody else, which is I think helped me out a lot in my puppetry, even though I love collaborating with people like you and, and other friends. But um obviously if, if people aren't around, I don't let that stop me either. God, I'm not good at answering questions. <laughs> I'm all <laughs> over the place. Oh my no, you're god. You're fine. You're fine. Well, and maybe maybe the the original question itself uh was not the right one cuz I, I when we were talking when we were talking to Madison Cripps on on Puppeteers, you mentioned something about how like kids like being scared. Mm, uh yeah. which maybe you were one of those kids I hated getting scared. Like I, I never, ever, ever enjoyed like even the scary parts of like a Rankin Bass Christmas special just scared the shit out of me. Um, were you, were you more apt to enjoy that kind of stuff? No, not at all. I just know oh, that from okay. just working with kids. I mean, think about it. The origin of, of that is peekaboo. It's a kid being surprised. I mean, in <laughs> sure. a lot of ways, that's all, uh, you know, um, being scared kind of is. It's just kind of, for the most part, especially talking about kids' entertainment, it's it's mostly an element of surprise. And it's it's a cheap thrill. It's a jump scare, things like that. And uh, and kids love it, you know. Peekaboo, oh, do it again, do it again. You know, ah! Uh, yeah, kids just... Kids just love that. What's a piece of advice that you think if a version of your past self, like a version of your past self from elementary or middle school, if if that version of yourself met you today, what's a piece of advice you think uh, he would give you? So a younger version of myself giving me advice now? Yeah. That's a really weird question. Do you not think about this kind of stuff? <laughs> Well, I think the other way around, like, what would I tell my my younger self? Because, I mean, like, I have more wisdom now. Are you saying, like, I probably had more wisdom as as a kid to give I, myself I'm now? Saying, I'm saying that I think, I think there are certain elements of someone's childhood where your, your outlook on the world and uh, just disposition is maybe less hardened um, than we are in our... 30s now um and whether or not it'd be like you know hey come here just like remember like just have some fun or or whatever i don't know dude we play with puppets i think we already do that <laughs> well I, no and that that's just I, like... <laughs> yeah no I, I i yeah no i i don't know man compared to where i started off as a kid i was a mess you know, I wasn't a bad kid, but like I, you know, I had very little direction as as I as I sh- should have very little direction as a kid. You know, you, you use that life to explore. I don't think there's any wisdom young Adam could give to myself now. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think so. I'm not saying no, you have to oh, listen oh, to it, but no, I, I would definitely do it the other way around. I would go back and 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 give myself little hints of things to get started in earlier. Fair, yeah. like. Uh, sewing a blazer sooner? Uh, definitely sewing a blazer sooner. I think that's something everyone should do, even if it's not wearable, like my first one was not. Mm-hmm. But honest, honestly, like mainly on, for me, starting YouTube is is really is really kind of what fixed me in a lot of ways. How do you mean? Like I mentioned earlier, with uh, like uh, having speech my whole life. And then them giving up on me <laughs> and, and my speech, um, you know, they'd always have, you know, try to get me to, to talk correctly, right? Pronunciation. I mean, it's not perfect now, but I never really saw it until I started doing YouTube. And some of my first videos, I look at them and, and, I, and I just listen to myself. I'm like, oh, I don't want to <laughs> sound like that. And in in watching myself and 
trying to turn myself into something that I, that I, not that I wanted to be, but that I knew that I could be was just a slow development in part of creating videos and learning how, how I sound, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what fixed it. And that's part of why I make a video every week. It's to kind of keep myself accountable on that. And, and also as an artist, right? Because like I said before, like a lot of time people need an excuse to create something, um, whether it's for a gig or for a show. And for me, it's because it's Wednesday. <laughs> so that's how I've been yeah. able to keep myself creative um, and just, you know, help turn myself into something I'm proud to be. Being kind to your future self. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. I think I think if my old speech teacher, if they saw me now, like it's crazy to think that um, I have a podcast, right? Yeah. It's crazy to think that even me as a teacher, you know, I don't even think if I, I'd be a teacher if uh, I, well, I knew I, I wanted to be a teacher for longer than that. I went to school for it and this and that. I even had a, a, a professor say that I'm not going to cut it <laughs> because of the way that I talk. Oh, you're kidding. And me. oh, gosh, no. Oh, gosh, no. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know his name, too, but I, I will I will save that. Fair enough. But so when I, I don't I never asked you. Like when that happened, because, you know, you know, I grew up with all sorts of health issues and I had my own fair deal of doctors who kind of like tossed their hands up in the air and said, like, we there's nothing we can do. Um, That's a really frustrating thing. Like how like were you upset about that or like were your parents, um, you know, because that's a that's a big thing to have happen and just be able to walk away from like, okay, whatever, you know, they did what they could. I don't think so. I, I, as I guess as a kid, I trusted authority a lot and I was like, well, they know. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, yeah. And, you know, in, in a way though, it, cause I was not defiant in any way. I did exactly what they told me. Oh, and sure. I think, I think in the sessions I did okay, but it just never carried over. You know, it's just and, and really, I think what it was is just hearing myself constantly. And, and honestly, I think not just the fact of doing the videos, but really editing, too, because uh, in the process of editing a video, you hear yourself. Yeah, I mean, a 10 minute video, I, I may edit it for eight hours, depending on how much footage I had. I got sick of hearing myself a certain way. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think back to like every once in a while, I'll revisit something from like when we were first hanging out 11 years ago. And I'm like, I don't even remember him talking that way, um, like to hear it. But yeah, it's it's changed yeah, a lot. No, it's changed a lot. And and even at that, even in those videos, that was after, you know, some some work as well, too. Sure. But like I, I have like old videos of doing magic and stuff like you can't even under. I mean, a lot of people couldn't even understand me like at a drive drive through a window like could not understand me even ordering something at a restaurant was sometimes tough for certain people some people had no problem but like certain people just like could not understand me at all people thought i was from a different country sometimes or one one person thought i was just like born deaf and they just this is how i talked because i couldn't hear something it's just like yeah it was um an obstacle for a long, long time in my life. Yeah, without a doubt. It's constantly in my mind. Mm-hmm. Like, there's not a moment where I'm not, like, still fighting it to some I was going to say, there, there's no way that, uh, yeah, that that wouldn't be ever present uh, in your head. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, that's why, that's, and, and even word choice, you know, there's certain words that I just try not to use to avoid you know, coming into uh, contact with those types of sounds that were always difficult for me. So. so the last weird question, and then I'll put you out of your misery with these. But this one I think you might be okay answering. It's a little okay. l- less weird. Uh, what's, what's the first time you remember getting caught in a lie? 
first time I remember getting caught in the lie. I don't think I got caught that much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I got caught that as a kid. Uh, I don't think I got caught that much. I don't. You know, none of my stuff. I wasn't a bad kid. Yeah. But, like, I did, like, I tried to stay home sick, pretend to be sick and stuff as a kid to, to get out of going to school. Uh, I hated school when I was a kid. But, uh, yeah. I think, yeah. And again, I, I suppose it. being one of nine, it was easy <laughs> to get away with things. <laughs> Maybe too. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it was. Well, actually, sometimes it wasn't too because tattle, the tattle tales. Well, right. Right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, it's a double edged sword without a doubt. I could tell you a couple stories about ones they got away with. <laughs> well, let's, let's hear one of those. Okay. <laughs> I must have been in like fourth grade and I was I wanted to stay home from school for some reason, probably a test or homework that I didn't do, something like that. And I told my mom, I was like, Mom, I don't feel good. Can I you're going to school? My mom made I think she part of why I think she made us go to school was to get stuff done while we were gone. <laughs> get the house back to square one <laughs> exactly exactly well because a kid when i got grounded it wasn't like I had to stay home it was i had to stay outside <laughs> yeah. i got grounded out of the house <laughs> and locked out um although of course my mom would deny it now it's true sure but um yeah i said oh mom i'm, I'm sick i don't feel good and she's like you're going to school i'm like oh boy and then i and then sometimes if i could finagle it where i was getting ready too slow and i missed the bus sometimes that was enough because you know, you missed the bus, right? She wasn't going to drive you. Yeah. Oh, no, no. She told me I had to walk. Well, I mean, it's, it's going to sound like I was uh, in the old days, had to walk to school. No, it was strange. It was just like the way, just the way it was back no, then. A little sure. house yeah. in Cheetawaga. It was far, though, man. It was very far. Oh, Looking yeah. back, I cannot believe that I was allowed to walk to school. But I was like, oh, I gotta get, I gotta get out of this. So I remember what I did. I remember I went to the, I went into the kitchen. I got a little cup and a spoon and just got got some stuff. I got like a little scoop of peanut butter, put it in this little cup, got some like, I don't know, some salad dressing, a little bit of jelly, put a little water in it, mix it all up, get it a little chunky, something to make it look like throw up, right? <laughs> and I put it in a little cup in my pocket inside my jacket. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to walk around the block and I'm going to put a little bit of it on the side of my shoe and just like a little bit on my cheek and tell her that I threw up and and that's what I did I walked around the block put it on my shoe put it on my face a little bit and then got home and was like mom oh, I, I threw up <laughs> and I stayed home that's a good that's a good cocktail <laughs> Yeah, there was some weird stuff in there. Yeah, Fred, if you're listening to this, yeah, <laughs> get ready for school. <laughs> yeah, and, and honestly, looking back to at the time, I wonder if my mom knew in some way and just like, wow, oh, yeah. he really doesn't want to go. I'll throw him a bone this time. <laughs> like it's the third, <laughs> it's the third try in one day. Like, fine, I'll give it to him. So this is the part of the show I, I call the the interview meet, uh, which is where we talk about how are you really? <laughs> With all the work that you do, you know, I, I think about how much you've clung on to, uh, you know, puppetry is one thing, but I mean, you're just such a remarkable art teacher. When you do that work, is are there elements of... Like, are you trying to further stuff about teaching or puppetry that you've seen and liked or trying to repair <laughs> mistakes that you've seen so, like, other people don't have to suffer through, you know, that one art teacher who you really hated or that one puppet show that you thought was really bad? I think really what motivates me about it is just, like, it's a way of being able to stay creative and having an excuse to do it. 
right? Like I think like I knew I wanted to be an art teacher since I was in fifth grade. And it was because like I told mentioned earlier, I never liked school much, but the only thing I did like was art. And it's like, well, I could do that. I could be in the art class forever if I was an art teacher. It's just a way of continuing to do what I want to do and being able to make a living out of it. But I mean, you do these YouTube videos, which you you just explained how, you know, you had some motives of, you know, trying to help overcome, you know, your your issues with speech. But like, you don't have to share all this information necessarily, but it seems like you're trying to help other people become better puppeteers or like there are other ways to make a living as an artist uh you know without having to deal with students and their parents and all that kind of thing so like name one <laughs> graphic designer <laughs> well again the, the those are jobs are hard to come by too right like well no I, first of all you have to have that skill and be good enough to do it and then you have to have to have someone who wants to hire you to do it not to mention that's something that's often depending on the size of the company of course you know this that that's uh shipped out right a lot of companies just uh, had some assets designed and throw it together for different things all the time too. Oh no, for um, sure. I mean, but I mean, I could I could lob that back at you and say, you know, most most schools have one art teacher, and there's someone who's been there for thirty or forty years, and you got to wait for them to retire or or keel over. I I just I guess I would have thought that you had that you were doing it for more than just you well no no of course oh absolutely it's for more than just me um i think i think part of why that is for me is because i don't know how else to say this to make it just sound like i don't almost pretentious (laughs) like i i just think that i have a good a good approach to art and making it really accessible you know sure for the same reasons that I talked about earlier that I don't like necessarily just to make art just to hang on the wall. Because even it's it's one thing that kids ask a lot is like, why do I need to know this? Why do I need to do this? I don't want to become an artist. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I've often received a good answer to that question, you know, from people. And I wanted to be able to answer that better for students yeah, and and the truth is, of course, art is all around us in every single way. The chair you're sitting in was sketched out by somebody and then made into something. Clothes design is everywhere, and and it's one thing to just say that because I think I have heard some people say things like that. But the other thing that was inspiration to me, like when I was going, and I've talked about this before on things, but like when I was. St- Um, in my undergraduate, I had to observe tons of art teachers all over Western New York. And one thing I always asked every single art teacher is, do you still make your own art? Out of every single one that I asked, again, over, well over 20, 25, 30, maybe art teachers, only one still made art. Only one. They all, they, they all said the same kinds of excuses. Oh, I do it all day, so I don't want to do it when I get home. Or I'm going to pursue my own art after I retire. Things like that. It was like, ah, I don't know, man. It's not for me to tell people what is and isn't their art. But it's like, you're not an artist. Because, you know, I don't know. Art, like to be a true artist, like it's not even a choice. Like it's just something that you, it's an outlet in, in, Um, it's a release and that's what the puppet building is for me I feel like if I didn't make these weekly videos again it's more of an excuse like I was mentioning earlier it's more of an excuse for me to be creative you know you know find an obstacle for me to figure out or if I have a faster way or easier way of making it accessible to people um, just sharing that And, and honestly too it's not just for for other people it's Again, like I kind of make those videos for myself for those reasons, for kind of that self help reason. And also, just like I, I reference my own videos. Like, how did I do that? I go back and I watch it again. So I'm kind of like just documenting things that I'm creating. And, and, and I think that's really important for me as a teacher because I don't think that there's a whole lot. I mean, there's definitely some. I don't think there's a whole lot of art teachers where their students can really see their art. 
I feel like any art that I saw of my art teachers younger was like, like, oh, I did this 20 years ago when I was in college. I'm like, okay, like, what have you done lately? I didn't have a bad art experience as a kid, but there was nothing that I would want to emulate about my art teachers growing up in myself, Mm -hmm. not by any stretch. Uh, but again, I wouldn't say it was a bad experience. It was just kind of nice just having kind of a more of a stress-free kind of environment compared to like being in the regular classroom, having to do the homework, having to do the math, the English. Like, oh, I just get to draw. I just get to make something. I get a release in that in that way, even though it wasn't always the pro- kind of project that I wanted to do. And I think that that's, um, that's what I try to emulate in my classroom more than anything, especially as an elementary art teacher. I don't even see my job as teaching them art. I see my job is making them excited to be there. So you you just mentioned how, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to go into puppetry because you wouldn't ever want it to feel like a job. Um, so is there something different about the teaching and your love for that that allowed you to say, well, like, that's going to be my job? I think the difference is is, is pretty pretty on its nose whereas like if i want to just be a professional puppet builder I'm, I'm taking orders i'm getting directions from people building things that i might not want to build just to get that paycheck whereas as an art teacher i have so much more control over what i'm going to be teaching with kids without a doubt there's guidelines yeah but you know at least now we're, we're in a time where that curriculum is pretty flexible and I can teach these things in almost any way that I want to, in almost any art style, different techniques. I've got a lot of control to really put myself into it. Whereas when I'm taking commissions and stuff, once in a while there's an opportunity to do that. But not like being an art teacher. Like I really get to be the chef rather than if I was a full-time puppet builder, I'd definitely be more of a cook. guys growing up and what i mean by that is um like did you have a set of maybe four or five individuals who were either performers or artists or musicians who you were sort of like not hyper fixated on but who you were really following of like i want to be like them or i want to create stuff like that or um was it a broader appreciation for you I don't think I looked at anything in that way. I just looked at things for what they were and never really thought about too much about where it came from or how it was made unless it was somewhat obvious in some way. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, I use this as an example when I, when and you've heard this a hundred times when I talk about the Muppets, like I never wondered like who made them. I never thought of them as something that was made. They were just, I was completely fooled by the illusion of those being characters. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until I got the peek behind the curtain that it really inspired me into puppetry. And that's the way it was with everything. When I watched, you know, a cartoon, like I did not for a second think about who the voice actor was. It wasn't. It was just the character, you know, like I didn't like Robin Williams. Like I didn't really realize who he was until I started seeing like things like Flubber, where I actually saw him as a human rather than like, oh, he does the voice of the genie. And then it starts connecting the dots a little bit. So, like, I just, I fully just, for what, I mean, maybe maybe it's a bad thing in some ways, too, but I just, I just completely fooled by those types of illusions in, in the world. Like, when I see a piece of art, especially as a kid, not for a second that I wonder, you know, who made it and why, I was just like, wow, look at that. That's so cool. I want to make one. Uh, just more how rather than why or who. I, I think we're uncovering, unearthing of of a huge discrepancy and it, it makes a lot of sense of how you think versus how I think. Because I would see, for instance, like a book by uh, Eric Carle and would become fascinated with how he made that and how he painted 
all the pieces of tissue paper and collaged them together and would just get so focused on how he did it that I would almost hesitate to create the work because I just loved how he made the thing. You know, I, I've talked about seeing Henson documentaries and being like, just I wanted to learn everything about how they did the thing um, versus, you know, necessarily getting up there and, and building a puppet character. So this is, um, I'm just in, intrigued and I, it's, it's telling me a lot about how, how you create even now of, you know, as we joke sometimes, like the way you sort of skip over some of the process stuff that could or should happen. <laughs> no, again, I, 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 I did that anecdote. I'll pretend like that happened to me. Let's say I looked at the Eric Carl book, not for a second when I have noticed or cared about the name of the author or the artist, uh-huh. not for a second. I just would have looked at it. Do I like it? Hey, it looks like cutout paper. I wonder if I can do that. Let me just try to emulate it, yeah. right? I would not have looked it up or any research. I would have just been inspired by that piece and just try to come as close as I could. Um, and, and obviously me being older now, it's a little bit, I still think I had that same starting point, but now obviously I do a lot more research on stuff, especially since like I have to purchase things that are, that are going to be, things are going to be made out of and whatnot and learn certain processes. But, um, but then again, too, it's, it's just kind of that whole thing about art is just like sometimes, I mean, even famous artists, you ask them about why, maybe they'll give you an answer, but some, maybe it's made up. Who knows? Oh, right. Maybe it came after, you know? Well, that's one thing I learned about artist statements in college. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. It's like sometimes things can just be like a, an expression of almost emotion rather than like, why do you want me to put this into words? Like it almost feels like felt to me in a lot of ways that it took away value from it in some ways like they're like i made this art because there's no words otherwise what I, maybe i would have wrote you a poem or something right no i i get that i don't, I don't think you do no i do i really oh, i do you? okay i do um and i i have some of the same apprehension especially around things like artist statements because yeah i mean those are just total bullshit and i i always say like if i'm not able to look at the piece and understand what um what you're trying to say i shouldn't have to read an artist statement uh to receive and understand your point um and i think that's where the graphic designer in me comes from is that like it the, yeah. the, it all needs to be on the page or on the canvas or whatever but um that doesn't stop me from seeing a layout or seeing a painting and be like oh i i gotta know more about how this was created not not the why of it uh so your family is growing, uh, and as we talked about, you um, you came from a, a a large family. Did you always expect that um, you know you'd have that you'd want to have kids of your own? Oh yeah, I definitely always knew that I wanted to have kids. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I I I wasn't sure how long that had you know because I you know you've been with Maria for for so long, and I I think it was not long before you had Fred. You once said to me, um, you were like, I have a five-year plan. And at the end of that five-year plan, it includes me having a five-year-old. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, did I say that? Yeah, it sounds you did. like something I may have said. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't believe I said that to you. That was pretty bold of me to say that to you. I mean, you were just you were just sharing what you felt. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, No, but I didn't know if you, like... If that was something that came with time or, you know, if, if growing up you were like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to marry Maria and we're not going to have anybody. <laughs> I just want to oh, be no, alone. No. I, I'd say if any part of probably what why I said that at the time was I actually always wanted, I thought I'd have kids uh, sooner than we ended up having kids. And it's probably for the best. I mean, obviously, as life goes on, I'm getting, you know, I, I mean, I didn't even have, I'm only on my, uh, starting my fifth year into this uh, job that I have, like, yeah, I was, well, <laughs> I don't know. You know, like, like I said, I, I, I always roll with the punches. If it happened, it would be fine. Everything would be fine. It'd be working out. I'd have an older kid now, but we have, we have Fred who is perfect now. She just started. I, I don't know if maybe, maybe one of my videos was playing in the background. Maybe Maria was watching it and she kind of caught on to it, but she started taking her socks off and using it as a puppet. <laughs> and, 
And I was like, okay, maybe maybe I will make her a simple little puppet. And and I brought her in for the process. We did that one video uh, with her. Um, and I I don't know. She 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 likes it. She just starred in your forty eight. <laughs> yeah, she did just star in the forty eight. She did a great job. She did. Too. She did a really good job. That that really uh, it it brings me to the next thing that I wanted to ask you though in a really nice way. Fred has found a love of puppetry seemingly like i was just over there the other day and you know she was yelling puppet 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 and he was excited by fozzy and waka waka and has her her love of puppetry and just like children's television um allowed you to see that puppetry in a new way kinda i guess uh, not (laughs) not in a way that's gonna impress anybody Uh, i mean just i mean just there's just so much trash content in the world yeah and uh, i see it in in my students sometimes the, the stuff that they watch and it's not like oh and i'm an old guy and i don't get it like objectively it's nonsense and and people gravitate and sometimes people gravitate toward it we don't let fred watch like way too much stuff uh, on um, you know, obviously, I mean, she's she's two. Uh, she doesn't. Con- we don't like just hand her you know, like an iPad. Let her explore YouTube on her <laughs> yeah. own or something like that. With without any, you know, sometimes she'll watch things that we're watching. If I'm watching another tutorial of something else, or uh, I watch a lot of movie reviews and stuff like that, it'll just be on in the background, and and just like even like stuff like that, she'll just be captivated by it too, and I, it just makes me want to in my content like there's so much stuff that's so formally academic and and that's great but there's almost like i just want something like when you look at like books that kids are reading the process of reading is the education part not so much of the content Mm -hmm. right and i wonder like i wonder if there's a way to do that more so for kids too like you wouldn't watch the movie Harry Potter and think, "Oh, look at all this curriculum." <laughs> yes, look at all this curriculum. <laughs> However, if you read it the book in school, you could easily make that curriculum in some way. And I wonder if there's, oh, you know, that's one thing I'm exploring now, is is a way of doing that for really young kids, like teaching them story, in in that kind of way. That's not like also tricking them into learning numbers and letters and things like that. Being able to model being a good person <laughs> and respecting exactly. others and just right? yeah, existing. Like, like it can be done in a way that isn't cringy. Yeah. Right. And I think and, and I, I don't think that there is enough of that. I feel like too many people are just trying to do trying to be school teachers when they're not. So as we start to wrap up, I always like asking people, how, how can we help? Um, and I, I guess one of the things I'd love to ask is like, when people, What's something that about you in create either creating puppetry or or in teaching that people think is easy, like real that they take for granted how easy it is when actually like that's the challenging part of your job that like keeps you up at night? I don't I I, I guess I just answer that with like I, I think that's also part of why. I have my outlook and why I do what I do. Cause like in watch, I mean, that's a comment that I get all the time from people like, wow, I didn't know how difficult it was to actually make a puppet until I watched your video. Because without a doubt, I mean, we both know this, what these characters look like. They look like toys. They look like stuffed animals. They look like something you can get at the department store for $30. But um, it's obviously so much more to that when you see when it's obviously so much more than that when you peek behind the curtain and that's kind of what my youtube channel is is in a lot of ways too which is kind of that kind of education for people if they wonder about you know if they wonder about like how this type of stuff can be made um it's it's an example of that 
uh, what's what's something in your life right now that if other that if other people knew it would make your life easier? And I I've said this to other people like not like oh they know that I'm not a millionaire so let's give me a million dollars please but like what what would make your life just like ten percent easier? I guess one thing that people just might not realize is uh you know even with a lot of my videos and things that I'm doing is like. Even though it's, I mean, all art that you're creating for yourself in some way is an expense, whether it's, if it's, if it's paintings, you have to pay for the paint, right? And obviously with puppets, you have to pay for the foam and the fleece. And we all know that that's expensive. But I think one thing that people don't realize, but someone like you would probably realize, is just the process to making some of these videos can be expensive. Um, Like I, like it's, I, I would say on average it you know each video costs you know you know about two hundred dollars for me to produce in some way through materials uh and sometimes I hire people out for cer- certain things and some of the music and graphics and whatnot subscriptions to your editing software like, oh my gosh yes like it really it really anything and everything and and again, I find ways to try to um, you know, people have been very supportive of me too. That's part of like my patterns that I have for sale on my website. I never planned to sell patterns, never planned to. I had free ones on there and that's all I ever planned to do was to have free ones on there. But then people started asking me like, is there a way that we can support you? And some people send me like donations on PayPal and things like that, which is, I'm very grateful for that, which is, which you know, and I'll just let them know too that like it, more more than a hundred percent of it goes back into um everything that I'm creating. It helps me buy more fleece and fur and um be able to I was able to get an editor uh, a couple months ago for the YouTube channel. They don't edit everything and sometimes I have to fix things. But uh but it just especially with starting a family now, because there's you know, it could have um you know, if this was only an expense in that way it would be harder to justify as I'm growing a family. But if I can keep this thing self-sustained, I can do it longer. And, and I want to do it longer. I want to be, <laughs> this is going to sound so strange and it's not going to sound as bad as it sounds when I say it. <laughs> um, I want to be really rich <laughs> because I hate money. <laughs> Does that make, because like I hate money so much that I just, I want to be rich so I don't have to think about it, mm-hmm. you know? But I'm sure people who are rich would be tell me, like, that's the kiss of death because it makes you think about it more or something. I, I don't think it would for me. I, I dare you to give me that challenge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Life, if you're listening, make me rich. I, I won't make you disappointed. Um. <laughs> well, our, you, you and I, for a long time, have had the master plan of befriending um, a, a non-problematic multi-billionaire to just mm, put yeah. put a billion dollars into our bank accounts just yes. for a day just give me interest for a day and yeah, i'll be good just i'll be live off the interest well, you know and actually you know i say this about my own youtube channel but the other perfect example of that is is the puppeteers podcast as well yeah you know like again i inv- i bought all this equipment you know i bought these mics i bought the the recorders i bought cameras i bought i sometimes i bought it i upgraded before we should have probably and things just because I, I i like doing that yes. <laughs> too i like i like upgrading but um you know, again, we were able to get some support, and obviously, we, it'd be nice to have more support uh, with with that too. And we have an editor for the podcast, which is remarkably helpful. And you know, it's the same thing. Like if, like if, if, if I mean, you could answer this yourself. If our podcast suddenly was making, let's say, it was making thousands of dollars, like that would only make our show better like it's not gonna we're not gonna retire and roll in it right um and what we would do with that we would we would do more yeah we would travel to visit people do more in-person uh interviews do more shop tours which is something i've always wanted to do more of um like yeah just like i just hate that uh money is so often an obstacle for things that uh that we want to do so i but that being said it makes me even more proud of everything that we've accomplished together 
because I think we've really accomplished a lot. I agree. And, uh, but I also think the best is yet to come. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, one more thing is as we're putting things out into the universe, uh, what's what's the next tool? Because I know you're a, you're a gadget guy. What's the next tool you want for your shop? I want so, so bad. I want a mill. I want a mill, a milling machine so bad. So for people who don't know what that is, it's like it's a machining tool. It's kind of like a lathe that's up on its side. It spins around. It looks almost like a drill press, but it's like it's for like machining very specific types of pieces. And oh my gosh, I want one so bad. Well, if any sugar daddy is out there listening, how can they uh, get in contact with you to learn more about your work and to, to get you a mill? They can follow me Everywhere, oh, uh, it's Adam at Adam Krutinger everywhere except for TikTok. It's at Puppet Nerd. Well, one last thing. Uh, I realized the last thing you need, uh, like a hole in the head, is another brother. But uh, know that I consider you a, a brother to me. Um, I think your legacy is already taking root, and um, please keep making art every day. Oh, I will. I'm going to drag you into it. I'd expect nothing less. Thanks so much for coming on, bud. Thanks for having me. We did it. You came to the end of another episode of This Should Have Been a Phone Call. So much thanks to Adam for stopping by and being so gracious in having this conversation with me. If this is your first time listening, there are plenty of other episodes of the show. Just go to phonecallpod.com and you can listen to all of them right now. Please give us a follow at phonecallpod wherever you get your, your social media. And if you're feeling brave, I always appreciate a good review or comment over at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps the show grow. But it also keeps unnecessary Disney sequels out of production. So I definitely appreciate that. We'll see you next time on This Should Have Been a Phone Call. Oh, and one more thing. I love you. You are enough. Keep going.